Wonderful. A very warm welcome for everyone joining us today for this opening plenary of the FAIR Digital Finance Forum. My name is Helena Laurent. I'm the Director General of Consumers International, and it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you here today. For the next hour, we'll be joined by fantastic speakers to kick off uh, a week of discussion about FAIR Digital Finance. Um, let's talk about World Consumer Rights Day. Every year on the 15th of March, that's tomorrow for those of you listening in today, um, we celebrate World Consumer Rights Day. It's a day when we think about our experience as consumers in a global marketplace, and we celebrate the work of consumer advocates around the world. Consumers International alone has members in 100 countries, so consumer advocates are everywhere putting the consumer experience first and foremost, and thinking about how we build a fair, safe, and sustainable marketplace for all of us. Each year, consumer advocates decide together on a theme. And this year, 2022, they picked digital finance. It is a critical topic for us to understand. It is a critical sector for us to shape. There are estimates that uh, by 2024, about 3.7 billion of us will be using digital finance in some way, shape or form, uh, increasingly all over the world. That has multiple opportunities for us, and we'll talk about those. It also brings with it risks, and we need to shape digital finance so that it, it supports, protects and empowers consumers in that marketplace. This week, we have a series of discussions from today through to Friday, looking at the way in which we can shape digital finance together. Um, a bunch of new initiatives will be launched, including a new accelerator, which supports consumer advocates in low and middle income, income countries, and a whole range of partners who are supporting us around the world. Um, in this session, we're going to set the scene for the week. We're going to understand the issues. We're going to shape the week and we're going to shape the tone of the week. So we're really about critical thinking, uh, but also respect and constructive dialogue across all of the different stakeholder types that need to be part of building together. And we're going to shape the action that happens beyond this week as well. If I can, and we're together, we're going to look at how consumer advocates can be a positive and constructive catalyst for change. If we can go to the next slide, I'm going to use that to uh, introduce our speakers. So the one after that, um, I'm thrilled to be joined by um, true experts from around the world. I'm going to start with our consumer advocates on the panel here today. Um, Gilly Wong is the Chief Executive of the Hong Kong Consumer Council. Uh, she sits on the board of the Competition Commission in Hong Kong, also on a number of different uh, groups in Hong Kong. She's also the Vice President for Consumers International on our board. Alan Kirkland has a long background in civil society groups in uh, Australia. He is currently the Chief Executive of Choice and sits on the board of Consumers International driving our Ethics Committee. Today, we are joined also by Shamina Singh. She is the president and founder of the Center for Inclusive Growth at MasterCard. She's also the executive vice president of Co corporate sustainability for the company and sits on the management committee. Ben Page is the chief executive officer of Ipsos Mori, the global... Uh, well, it's, it's, now, it's now Ipsos rather than just Ipsos Mori, because I was Ipsos, in... Ipsos, thank yeah. you, Ben. That's thank okay. you, Ipsos, excuse me. Um, the global uh, organization really helping us understand consumer perception. Um, he has a long background, of course, at the organization, uh, multiple, much support to uh, a number of uh, governments in the UK and is a visiting professor at King's College London, among other titles. And Jagun Ndungu is executive director of the African Economic Research Consortium. Uh, he is the former governor of the Central Bank of Kenya. Um, and we are thrilled to be welcoming all of them uh, to give us their insight here today. I'd like to, to make sure that we are centered on perhaps uh, what we are trying to shape. If we can move to the next slide, this shows what 
we need to be looking at for digital finance. It's the view of consumer advocates around the world and recognizing that digital finance is one sector that is in evolution. The view of consumer advocates who are thinking day in, day out about the experience of consumers, their view would be this should be built to be inclusive so that everyone can easily access affordable, reliable digital financial services. It should be safe so consumers get maximum benefit and are confident that their money is secure. It should be data protected and private so that identity and rights are respected. And it should be about sustainability. Digital financial services should drive climate finance and incorporate environmental impact considerations in the way they work. And I'd love to come to the panel now to understand a little bit about how they think we can reach those goals. So first, let me come to Alan. Uh, first, the meaning for you of World Consumer Rights Day. Why is digital finance such an important topic to pick for World Consumer Rights Day? And what do you think we should be, you know, what are the biggest issues we should be working on together? Well, it's important to recognise that World Consumer Rights Day hasn't always been around. In fact, tomorrow is the 60th anniversary of the event that, that created it in a way when John F. Kennedy gave a speech to the US Congress where he outlined what came to be known as the Consumer Bill of Rights, um, where he talked about a number of rights that we take uh, for granted today in many parts of the world. And that was the first time that a world leader had talked about the notion of consumer rights as something that you might consider in a similar way to an extension of human rights, if you like. Um, so it's really important for us to mark that day because that's provided the, the foundation for the laws that we've seen um, in our own um, countries around the world. And there's still lots of progress to be made. Um, I think when we think about finance specifically, um, if you just think back to 1962 and how our financial sector has changed internationally and at a national level, it's massive. Um, and indeed, most of that change has actually happened probably in the last 20 or 30 years with the acceleration of digital and then mobile technology. And um, every day, it seems we're seeing new products that actually have, on, one, on the one hand, the potential to really transform the way that consumers use and control their money, but on the other hand, if they're not implemented appropriately, can present risks. And I think the great opportunity for us is to work out how we bring those things together. So how do we capture some of the benefits of innovation in ways that can really benefit consumers, benefit the economy for the benefit of all, um, but do that in ways that avoid the risks and ensure that consumer protection is built in from the very beginning. And how do you think consumer advocates can play a role in this? Well, in Australia, um, Consumer advocates are often the first people to see when something's going wrong in a, in a sector of the economy. So, um, e, for example, we have networks of financial counsellors who are based in civil society organisations all over the country. They help people who can't afford to pay their bills. They're the very first people to see when there's a new financial product that's actually causing harm, that's leading to people getting into debt that they can't afford and, and ending up in a, a downward spiral of debt. Um, so I think as consumer advocates, um, we listen to people like that working on the front line and we're the first to sort of articulate to government, to regulators where there might be a problem. But we also, um, we're civil society organisations that operate in a market economy. We actually believe that if you can make the market work well, then that will, alongside consumer protection laws, create the best outcomes for consumers. So I think that what we bring to the table is that understanding of risk, but also a real will to actually see good products and services and to work with regulators and with businesses that are trying to do the right thing to actually drive innovation that is actually going to deliver good outcomes for consumers. Thank you so much, Alan. Let me come to you, Gilly. Um, your experience uh, of World Consumer Rights Day, also your view on why digital finance is an important topic to pick in 2022. Well, um, I think um, the, the date, uh, the March 15th is already embedded um, in every consumer protection uh, agencies or organizations. Um, this is a very important date for us. Uh, no matter what topic, what subject we select, those are always the most important subjects for consumers that we can collate our work, um, have an 
um, integrated effort together um, to make something to happen and to sound out a very important subject. Maybe it may not be fully aware by consumers, but by uh, keep on advocating for it through a global concerted effort that really helps to drive up the priority of, uh, of the subject matter. We have a lot of success in the past and I'm sure uh, this time will be another success for us because when you talk about digital finance, we have to go back to the very fundamental thing is when we talk about consumption, you need money. There's a, there's a transaction um, between the buyer and the seller and it is all in a marketplace that um, the um, money is a form of a medium for us to make the transaction and consumption always, you know, uh, involve the, um, a certain form of uh, payment. Um, so I believe no matter it is simply from a banking service, like a fixed deposit or just a simple transaction, all the way to a very sophisticated uh, financial services from the, from the banks, um, consumers have different needs on that. And um, especially when we talk about um, the sophisticated markets, obviously there are many people to take care of. But on the other hand, there are the vulnerables that we always have undermined a lot. And when I read many different kinds of papers, um, and this is a very common theme about when we talk about driving fair digital finance, we have to really take care of the disadvantaged people and also the misuse or abuse of data. So I strongly believe that uh, we pick a really wonderful topic that we can work on the long term and there are huge opportunities for us to work together on that as well. What are your hopes for this week in particular? Well, um, exciting. Uh, I, I think... Um, it is a wonderful program that you put together very important aspects of, um, of our financial services. I'm talking about the digital aspect of it. So uh, I really look forward to all the consumer protection agencies and our affiliates. Um, we can really join together on this virtual platform to exchange um, and also create inspiration to each other um, so that no matter which countries you are from, uh, you can learn something from the other and also inspire you to think about um, when you want to develop your strategy in your market, what are the key aspects that can um, really make it effective in your own market? Because different markets may have different issues, different priorities, but as long as you know, we listen to each other, um, that definitely will create some kind of um, inspiration for us. I'm also looking forward to that as well. So thank you very much, Alan and Gilly, for setting, starting us off with consumer advocacy view, what we can do as consumer advocates, and some of the key issues we see, including um, a, a focus on more vulnerable consumers. Ben, if I can come to you at this point, I mean, I think one of the fascinating things you do is also use the insight you gather to advise companies on how they might approach uh, the, the future. What advice would you give at the moment based on what you're seeing about how to build a trusted brand in digital finance? I mean, it's, it's one of the things that we look at and obviously many of our clients are some of the world's largest uh, financial organizations. So I, I think what's, what's interesting about trust in banking is actually that it's not as necessarily low as some people might think. And actually globally, uh, we saw quite a significant rise in trust in banking during the pandemic. But, so, but at the same time, uh, banking is a long way behind something like medicine in terms of levels of, of trust. And about as many people say they distrust banking globally as trusted. And one of the things that um, I think we really, and I'm sure you'll, this will resonate, resonate with colleagues, is that banks are generally competent. They don't generally lose your money. Uh, but uh, where there is a problem, and in particular when we're looking at what drives trust in the sector, is that in, in a sense you can, see, you can see trust as consistency and reliability, uh, perhaps multiplied by um, emotional connection, and then divide that by motivation. It's a, way of, it's a way we think about trust. And the problem that banking has, particularly as it closes down those traditional relationships that people had with real people, a bank manager that people, you know, even me, I'm 57. When I first borrowed money to buy a house, I went and met somebody and they met me and they decided, do I, do I trust him? Will I lend him the money? And now of course, it's all, everything is automated. And so the challenge, a couple of challenges, I think, first of all, 
how do banks build emotional connections, but also particularly important, a sense of trust in their motivations? Because the challenge the sector has often with consumers is that they know that they're good with money because they're bankers and they're often rich, well, occasionally it goes wrong. But of course, we don't necessarily trust their motivations. We believe that they would exploit us if they could, they would missell products, they would overcharge us, et cetera. They're not on our side. So as we move into digital, a digital relationship with banks, the key question is how do they build that emotional connection and also persuade consumers and demonstrate to consumer advocates that their motivations are actually fair. They're not profiteering, they're serving people fairly and also all sections of society because one of the biggest anxieties when we look at inequality globally is this sense of um, uh, income inequality globally is, the, is one of the biggest challenges. And we're going into a world now which is very different from the COVID world, although we've still got COVID in China and, and it's not gone away, but where we can see massive inflation, massive food price problems in some countries that are net importers of food. The world in the 2020s and many of the most hard pressed consumers are going to be squeezed. And so you've got all of those pressures, plus, of course, this ongoing concern, in a sense, what I call cognitive polyphasia. So consumers are worried about their privacy and security, and that uh, isn't going down. But at the same time, they're starting to accept that the digital world means that you will almost inevitably lose some privacy. Uh, and that's a global phenomenon. So it's a very, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing time. We, we saw during the pandemic, massive growth in online banking, digital banking, but at the same time, banks have, have not yet convinced us they are on our side. And that is, that is a massive opportunity for them. And if we don't get it right, of course, the, the, many of the things that we need to happen won't happen because consumers won't make the switch or won't fully commit to it. If you look at the vision of safe, inclusive, data protected, private, sustainable, would you add anything to that in order to help build that trust? Uh, to be honest, I think you've got uh, enough, enough, you've got some pretty bold ambitions there, particularly when you add in sustainability, because on sustainability, what I find interesting is that everybody wants their bank to do the right thing and not invest in, I don't know, weapons or you know, massively polluting industries. The challenge is when you really push people, and this is the same in so many areas of sustainability, they also want really good returns on their money. And they aren't really prepared to accept massively lower returns but, um, just so that the bank is investing only in, I don't know, eco-friendly projects or something like that. So it's, uh, I think you've got enough, to be quite honest, I think you've got enough things there, but there is something about there is something there about bank, banks making promises on their ethical and sustainable behavior. Brilliant, thank you. Well, Shamina, this is a perfect setup for you, I think. In your role, you're thinking about these issues and how do we build a more inclusive financial services sector? You're thinking about corporate sustainability. Um, tell me, sort of first, maybe take a step back. Are we have we covered the right issues to start off? What's the burning question on your mind? And then I would love to hear your view. What are the interventions that we need to make to build better? I think it's a great topic, and um, I'm excited about uh, Consumer Rights Day. You know. Uh, we started, I'm at the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, and the vantage point, I think that we bring to the conversation is that we're in network, a payment network in over 210 markets who built a payment platform based on trust and had to be inclusive by design. And so what does that look like currently when you're trying to build out a platform in a digital economy? It's the same principles. And so that's why I do agree with the principles that you all have uh, raised in the beginning are the exact same principles that we adopted um, as we moved into the digital economy. We call them inclusive finance principles and we created them alongside a number of other companies um, at the World Economic Forum. But basically uh, the idea behind them are the same, I think the same four that you've put in. What does that mean for a company like MasterCard? It means that we go back to basics, which for us has been, for consumer protection perspective, things like zero liability. It means um, uh, 
no fraud. And if you are defrauded, you get, uh, you get compensated. Um, I think the biggest thing that it means um, is that your data is your own. And so at our uh, company, we actually created data responsibility principles because we knew that the economy is now digital by default. And so we decided to make our products and services around data in particular, um, privacy by design. And so I think that the piece that is really interesting to this conversation is, um, especially for consumers, is that you don't want to reorient the system. You want to build it the right way from the beginning. And I think that to me is the biggest, the burning platform is that these things are happening right now. They've been happening. They accelerated during COVID. We saw the biggest increase in digitization during COVID, but we also saw the fastest increase in poverty for the first time. So the thing that we realize is that being a digital first economy uh, means that we have to put uh, the customer at the center of everything we're doing. And that starts, I think, with a grounding in being inclusive by design, but it also starts in a perspective um, that is about data and that the customer owns their data, they should benefit from their data um, and they should control their data, but companies like MasterCard can help protect the data. And I think if you start from a place um, of that kind of data responsibility, you end up with a, in a place where you can have a set of inclusive finance principles, much like the ones that you've described here, and you can build on them um, on through consumer advocacy organizations instead of uh, creating a race to the bottom where you do it without any kind of government partnership. The idea here is to say that can you start from a place of creating incentives that align for a race to the top to benefit customers and consumers, not a race to the bottom. And I think that that starts um, and it ends with partnership with government and a strong regulatory framework um, and to really start having conversations about being regulation versus unregulated uh, trans, uh, transaction networks. And that's why I'm so delighted that we have the former governor on the same panel here today. Perfect, thank you much, so much, Shamina. And let me bring in um, Jagun at this point. Um, I'd love to hear, so we've heard from other panelists about what they feel are the most pressing issues um, that we should have on our uh, agenda this week. Um, would you share your perspective from the regulator uh, side? And you're on mute. Oh, if I, can I, was you to I was forgetting that I'm, I'm mute. And thank you very much. And I'm very happy to be invited to this session. Of course, it looks like my history is always catching up with me, even though I've gone back to my early life of research and capacity building. I'm, I'm with the African Economic Research Consortium, which is a capacity building network uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa through research and graduate training in economics. We are nonprofit. We have been there for the last 34 years. But I've come back here, uh, of course, to provide some more research. But, Today, the, the topic of digital financial services is very, very critical because this is what I started with when I was appointed governor in 2007. I would have said the same thing what Ben has said, but I could not have talked about how I was my first loan and how I was mistreated because now I was looking after all the banks. What I did was to change how the banks work. But I'm trying to talk about digital financial services. I want to make two points. One of them is the emerging evidence of digital financial services. And coming from the African scene, this is quite, quite significant. And the second point I want to make is how do we sustain that evolution? Let me start with the first one. In the first one, I think I want to talk about emerging evidence and there are six points I want to make. I will make them very quick. First, the introduction from 2007, and we have seen that in African economies, reach electronic payments platform that was using the mobile phone. And that is the starting point. But the most important thing is that it was effective, it was efficient, it was transparent, and it was safe. And that was very, very important. And the moment you get this acceptance, then it means that you can actually uh, move that platform to satisfy all diverse uh, 
uh, uh, economies. And, and retail electronic payments is actually the entry point in financial services. Now, coming back to Africa, in the African setting, there are so many segments of market. We call them segmented markets. And you, when you have such an instrument that is navigating across all segments of the market from formal to informal, it's really a success. And for me, that is very, very important. And I've seen that during the COVID, it was also used to actually have a platform for targeted social protection program. You can imagine it can be diverse. The second point is that banks realized that they could use this technological platform to manage small accounts, micro accounts, micro deposits and micro savings accounts. And so it means that it was a success in terms of financial inclusion and what we now call inclusive finance. And for me, in the developing world, access to markets is one of the major issues and access to financial markets is a very critical point. And so it means that retail electronic payment system becomes very important. And the point we have made here is that once the retail electronic payment system is working, is efficient, then it becomes a game changer. The third point is that within no time, there were virtual savings and virtual credit supply platforms. And that is very, very important because they were actually using your transactions data and your savings to generate credit scores to, to price short-term credit. And that you can imagine the powerful message of trying to change the collateral technology that has inhibited credit growth, credit market growth in Africa. It's a really a revolution. And the, the fourth point is that Financial inclusion and even market access allowed the central bank to formulate a forward-looking monetary policy framework. And it was very, very, um, should I say revolutionary, even it was adopted the whole of East Africa after starting it in Kenya. You, you realize the innovations in the market needed a, a better framework of monetary policy. Fifth, uh, the digital transactions platform allowed the monitoring of, of uh, financial transactions. It improved the AML CFT regime. And this was quite a very important aspect because essentially you can monitor electronic transactions. And finally, one of the celebrated outcomes which actually uh, links the dots to the consumer protection is actually allowing you to develop diverse products. Especially for women, they can save in diverse products that cannot be encroached. And that is very, very important. They are efficient savers. And so we, we are able to watch that. And in fact, there's a study that has shown that the women household, the women headed households were, were actually rifted from poverty. Actually 2% of the population in the last 10 years before the COVID was actually lifted from poverty. And this, the majority of them were house, uh, female headed households. So what it is showing is that poor, uh, financial inclusion can actually be a very strong weapon of poverty reduction sustainably. And for us, that is very, very important because the poor can save in, uh, and, and escape from cycles of poverty. Th those six areas, we can empower them, they actually become very, very important even when we come down to say, where does the consumer benefit? What about consumer protection? What about uh, the, 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 all the other issues? But maybe we can discuss that. Let me come to my second point. My second point is that, if that is a success story, how do we sustain that? And especially coming in diverse countries that, you know, even, even in our, our neighbors in the East African region, most of them have not taken up this. If you want to see the totality of what fi digital finance is working, it's, it's actually an example of how it is working in Kenya and Tanzania. Other countries are trying to, to break culture. But the beauty of it is that it is now becoming the norm. But then how do we sustain this? The first point is connectivity. We have to make sure that no one is left behind. And the other thing is that if we have an infrastructure of catch, uh, uh, including everyone, that is uh, fiber optic cables, for example, to include the capability of the internet. When the, when the little electronic payments platform in Kenya started, we didn't, all, we didn't have all these fiber optic network. We managed, by, by, but at least now we have that fiber, uh, opt, the fiber optic network. The beauty about this is scalability to include everyone. And that is very, very important that we have the scalability of the digitization process, and it's going to become very sustainable. The second point is that we started, or even other countries in Africa and even other regions, they started with different companies or telcos having their payments platform in banks, commercial banks. But they were not talking to each other. Different platforms were not paying, talking to each other. And we have to slowly move now to, to try and push for interoperability interoperability will enlarge the market and lower unit cost. 
and this is very good for consumers. And at the same time, we want to make sure that we move from uh, not only across payments platform, but cross border. And we have seen that remittances for those companies that have started remittances across are becoming very, very important. So essentially, we can see that we want to enlarge the market. And the only way to support an appropriate market development is through interoperable platforms. Third, electronic payment system require electronic ID system to cope with that. In Kenya, we still have the physical ID. You have the number, but it is the process to verify. But if we have electronic ID system, it is going to protect the market. And this is very important for consumers. And before I take so much time, let me talk about the final one, which I like most. I want to talk about state and institutional capacity because it is the regulator who should protect, regulate, and nudge the market to the optimal path. If you don't do that, we all not wake up. In most of the countries that have gone in Africa, sent by an organization to talk to regulators to try and open up the market, they have failed and they have not moved. That for us is very, very important. We want to make sure that there is state capacity in terms of uh, regulation, protecting the market and nudging the market to the open part. I think this, those are the four points on how we can sustain this revolution. But the most important thing is the starting point is that where we are in terms of digital finance, we can modify it and protect it so that it benefits the consumers in totality. Thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, I just want to recognize and welcome participants on the call. We have participation from Mali to Myanmar, from Tajikistan to Japan, and from Korea to Costa Rica, with pretty much everywhere in between, which is normal for consumer advocacy. So thank you for being here. Um, I'm really looking forward to your presence during the rest of the week. What we heard in the first part of this panel was, I think, a broad agreement that we're heading the, in the right direction for our vision, with some queries about how fast we might get there on certain areas. Um, but I really loved then, uh, Juguna, that you are taking us into so what? So how do we build together? How do we shape uh, in the way that you've uh, laid out? It is possible to build together. So let's move into where next, and I'll come back to my consumer advocates. What do you see as opportunities to build on digital finance for the future? Um, I know there are a couple of things that we've got planned uh, ourselves, but then I'm sure there are many other ideas. Can I come to you, Alan, first? I think the critical thing is really, as we see new products and services emerge, leveraging digital technology and mobile technology, that we actually learn the lessons from the old products of the past and we apply them in, the, in this new world. So um, if you take the issue of um, protection of funds, which Shamina mentioned, which is something that's sort of built into the credit card schemes around the world. Um, you know, if you pay for something with a credit card and you don't get it, you can generally get, get the money back. Um, and there's reasonable fraud protection in those schemes. Yet we see new products emerging that don't have the same protection because they've emerged very quickly, um, perhaps from um, businesses that don't understand why some of those rules have been important in the past. And the other problem is often that our regulatory frameworks, our laws are written for the old types of banks, the old types of payment systems, and um, these new products get around the edges of those laws. So I think that what we need to be doing, and this is really a perspective that consumer advocates can bring, is identifying what are those core protections that build upon the vision, the principles in the vision for, for fair consumer um, digital finance, and, and how do we apply them in the new framework and working with, with innovators, with business, and with regulators to make sure that consumers enjoy the same sorts of protections, whether they're using the, operating in the old financial world or the new digital financial world. And I think where Consumers International can come in is in actually bringing all of that together. So bringing together consumer advocates from around the world, and in particular, our enormous network among consumer organisations in low to middle income countries, but also bringing together those consumer advocates with, um, with businesses, with regulators to actually talk about how we ensure that as these new products emerge, they actually operate in a way that's, that's fair for consumers. Otherwise, what happens is you have some sort of giant calamity or collapse, and then you lose trust and it's hard to win it back to go back to the point that Ben was making. Helena, can I just jump in for a second? Because I think um, I just want to bring to life what Alan is talking about. Um, and that is data, right? So I think in the new digital economy, 
data becomes a currency unlike anything else we've ever seen. And so I happen to be in India because I'm visiting one of our partners who runs something called Mandeshi Bank. Chetna Sinha uh, has always said, don't make poor products for poor people. And so when I think about data, you know, on the MasterCard network, we only collect the data that is required to make the transaction. And so Governor talked about ID and, and all of the other pieces. So we only collect, we don't collect your name. We don't, we're not allowed. We've, we've decided as a company, that's not our interest. We connect whatever's, we collect whatever's required to ensure that your transaction goes, the buyer's money goes to the seller, the seller provides the buyer with what they have agreed to sell them. And if there's something wrong with that purchase, that buyer can get something back. You don't need to know the gender. You don't need to know their, where they live. You don't need to know anything about them when you're dealing in pulling only the data and identity constructs that are required to perform the service. I worry that with the new technology that's coming, People think that these protections don't exist, that somehow we're creating this digital system that has no history of protection, when in fact, we've been operating in a system where data privacy is actually the primary function and consumer protection is actually the status quo. So I think that as uh, your organization starts to think about these issues is to not forget the, the, the impact and the privacy and the protections that companies have created um, over time. Don't lose that in this race to create the fintech of the future and the digital economy of this. Don't forget that the customer has to be kept whole and kept at the center of the equation. Let me add one more, one more point uh, to what you've just said, uh, Tuara. The, the, just imagine a situation where you have retail payments that the turnaround is three to five seconds and it is real time. It means that you are in control that if you make a mistake in transfer, you will notice and you have, you have time to reverse it. And if you, even, before, even if you go beyond the time that's required, you just send that message and it will be reversed. So over time, I can tell you, over, when we started the M-Pesa, for example, the M-Pesa product, it was taking like 45 seconds. Today it takes between two and five seconds between three and five seconds. You can imagine that real time and the turnaround time is very, very important in terms of your own protection as a, as a consumer or even the person you're sending to. And you are able even to notice that you have made a mistake. And secondly, the menus are improving every day. I think uh, just like Shamira is saying, that the, the, the regulations behind it is still there. Most people in Africa especially doubted the regulatory capability because there are two regulators. One of them is a Telcos, the, the regulations of, from the communication, that is Telcos. And the other one is, the, is the, the financial regulator. But I think that has been um, overcome because those platforms, payments platforms, are sitting in commercial banks. So it is still the purview of the central bank. So at least we have solved that kind of uh, segmentation in terms of, uh, in, in terms of, um, uh, in terms of uh, regulation. But the beauty about it for me is real time and the turnaround time, which becomes very, very important. I, th I think, Helena, that's a, a, an interesting example because um, I think with real-time payments, we've seen both good and bad around the world. So in some countries where real, real, as real-time payments have been introduced, what we've seen is a massive increase in scams and people losing their money. And because it's so instant, they haven't been able to get it back. But what governments are realising now is they need to build stronger protections around real-time payments so that, that if you are scammed, if you are defrauded, then there is ability, you've got a better ability to identify the person that, that you, that's asking you to, you to send money to them and to get their money back. But there's actually been a period of time that we're still living through in some countries where consumers are actually exposed to greater risk of scams and fraud until we get the regulatory framework to catch up and in order to then deliver the benefits that real-time payments can provide. I was going to back that up. Two stats. One in three people in Southeast Asia experienced online fraud amid the boom in online banking um, during COVID. And then as a sort of an equivalent fact, uh, in Bangladesh, Cambodia, Uganda, only 11% of customers who experienced difficulties with mobile money reported it because they don't know how to report it. 
Um, and then the, the lack of in, enforcement then is one of the, the, the situations. So, um, you know, in the UK, even it can take two years for a scam case to get to court and police have limited resources to find and stop scammers. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's that how do we make that sort of that trust become a marketplace reality? Gilly. And a norm and an incentive. So don't do business with companies that haven't adopted principles around uh, inclusive finance. And don't, that's the, I mean, and I think that's such a big part of what you all represent and can do is to sort of say, if companies are, are able to do this kind of thing, then there's something wrong in the market. And so it, unless, until and unless they become regulated in such a way that either they do it by design, which is what companies like ours have done, that should be the norm. And if you're not doing it by design, then don't do business on a platform. Shamina, are you sure you don't want to become a consumer advocate? I am a <laughs> consumer advocate. Yeah. That's why I'm at the MasterCard <laughs> Center for Inclusive Growth. Helena, I, I, I want Gilly. to jump in uh, on this Please. point because uh, no matter where we are uh, in this part uh, in, in the world, I think um, the data security, um, fraud and scams, uh, transparent use of data, and also data analytics, privacy, all these are the core issues that all markets have to work on, frankly speaking. So going back to your questions about uh, what are the opportunities, I think fundamentally at the global level, um, we really have to work together um, to influence the international arena, such as the, the uh, international organizations like the UN, IMF, World Bank, G20, or OECD, because just by pushing them all along the time uh, with a concerted way, um, that can really help us to drive the standards um, to continue to lift it up on security, on data protection and privacy. Because if different markets have different standards, it's impossible for us to have a harmonized um, global uh, digital finance uh, marketplace for everyone. So I strongly believe the fact that um, as consumer protection agencies and advocates, we really have to work on this together. And the second point that I, I strongly felt is even when we are keep driving the digital finance marketplace, we shouldn't undermine the non-digital channels. Reasons being is things move on like a continuum, continue to move on. But if we just focus on the digital um, uh, financial marketplace, but undermining the non-digital ones, we are harming the underprivileged a lot. So while we are driving the fair digital finance, we should drive the non-digital channels as well to ensure that it is a fair market and also it can have a soft progression for the vulnerable consumers. Um, otherwise, you know, they will be the one to sacrifice. Um, this is something that I want to highlight. And the final point that I want to make is about um, since uh, we are, it is a platform of CI, I want to make use of this platform to promote um, our FAIR Digital uh, uh, Finance Accelerator, which is a new initiative for us to support the low and medium um, income countries, to train them, um, to train the consumer organizations how to lobby and engage with governments and uh, industry um, stakeholders. But I really want to stretch this platform a little bit uh, broader by building a robust systems for consumer organizations to exchange um, some scams and also um, frauds cases that we can send out alerts to consumers in a very timely manner. Reasons being is all these kind of international frauds and scams move from one country to another country all the time. So I strongly believe that relying on the government, it may not be fast enough. We should be the one to, once we spot that, we should send out the alerts as soon as possible in order to mitigate the loss of consumers. So, but at the local level, obviously we can continue to educate the consumers, uh, work with our local governments. We should seize every opportunities to expose and also to point out, to highlight, you know, um, the focus of our advocacy. But I do believe the fact that at the global arena, these are the three areas, you know, that we have to focus on. Brilliant, thank you. And you got a, a plus one from the US about really sort of pushing for global uh, action there as well. I'd love to pick up on your question about, on your point about making sure that um, the traditional uh, financial sector is still 
uh, robust whilst we prepare for digital finance. I'd love to hear the views from uh, Juguna and from Shamina and Ben, perhaps if you'd like to sort of chip in on this, how do we how do we make sure how do you how do you think about that when you really sort of are building an inclusive approach? Thank you very much, because I think that is a very important question, because there are people who believe that you cannot you don't want to be an early adapter. You would want to wait until things settle. But here we're talking about efficiency. By the way, even those who take up the, 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 the old borrow, they still go to the bank and do their transfers. It is safer, it is so there, but you have to take a trip to the bank. Of course, if you are in African countries, you know taking a trip to the bank is really a major effort. But the bottom line is that, let me start from the very beginning about security. You don't, it is not everybody who participates in the digital financial system. You have to be registered. And for example, in Kenya, we made sure that every ZIB card is registered if you want to participate in the system. So it means that we have that. Now, there are two things here. If you are doing wholesale payments, obviously then you have to go into a computer and go to the banking system and do that. But that is still digital. If you are doing retail, you can sync back to your phone and just do that. So essentially, there are very many ways. I do believe that a market should be accessible but it can cater for different aspects of different customers. That is, you can determine where you, which space you want to, to be in. And that is the beauty about the market. You want to be in a segment that you're most comfortable in. And that is very, very good. What we are seeing is that traditional uh, systems is also changing. Not necessarily they go to the bank and they, or you go to your computer and you want to go into a SWIFT mode, you have a SWIFT electronic funds transfer, and it's was working across countries. So it means that we are all moving towards that. But I think the point I was mentioning is that we are moving towards efficiency. And that is something that we'd like to watch on. But we have put in the lower, the lower uh, should I say, segment of the society in terms of low income and low transaction and, and uh, very micro transactions. To the, to the platform, because essentially, if they were to do the traditional stuff, that's going to be very, very expensive for them, it's going to be risky for them. For me, that segment of the market is very, very important. They are per segment, they are free to do anything they want, they, and, and, and that is what is happening. But as somebody said, I think somebody said that there will be a convergence in the long run. Everybody would go to that, but you pick up the segment of the market you want to operate in, and others pick the rest. And that is what, how I would uh, maybe summarize that. Thank you. Shamina, how do you approach this question? Um, I think I think I think the governor made um, excellent points. I guess I what I'd like to use is an example, right? So in in Kenya, actually, um, and this speaks a little bit to our approach. Um, the opportunity that comes with the digital economy is really interesting, but you have to be able to use it in a way that benefits the most vulnerable. So for as an example, we created a partnership with Unilever in Nairobi that actually used the buying and selling behavior of their shop owners, mostly women, to help recalibrate their credit score. So for example, we went to Unilever and said, these women who own these shops can only buy inventory that they can sell in one day. What if we, what if we worked with Kenya Commercial Bank, which is also one of our partners, to say, can we look at their buying and selling behavior on the Unilever platform to identify their credit behavior? And could Kenya Commercial Bank recognize that as behavior that's worthy of a little bit of an increased amount of loan so that they can buy more to sell more? Um, that example, over 80% of the women shopkeepers on, in this program have increased sales by at least 26%. But what's also interesting is they've established credit with Kenya Commercial Bank in a way that Kenya Commercial Bank was trying to figure out how to understand and go after this segment in a way that helped them. The women shop owners were trying to figure out how they could earn more money on their, uh, in, for their shops. And Unilever, of course, was trying to figure out how they could put more of their products on these women's shelves. And so I think that the idea here is to say that, again, there are programs and there are ways of doing this work that are 
potentially win win wins all the way around. And so I think that, but to do that requires a little bit of creativity, a little bit of innovation, but it requires bringing everybody into the conversation to understand what's what the art of the possible, I guess. And I think for me, that's what's also interesting about the digital revolution is that it's actually an evolution that we are constantly having to make sure we're doing this the right way. Brilliant. If I could just touch on a final topic, and I know we're in the final 10 minutes, but part of our vision is about sustainability. And I know Ben said, well, you know, are, are consumers really thinking about that in finance now? And I suppose we're inspired both by the urgency of reaching the sustainable development goals and, and uh, reacting uh, to the climate crisis, especially for younger generations, and also by practical examples. For example, in New Zealand, um, where uh, data through financial transactions is actually being used um, to help drive uh, people to understand their carbon footprint um, and change their consumption patterns. So I'd love just a brief view from the panel about how we build, because I think this is about a leadership story of leaning into that and helping build that together. Okay. Ben, can I come back to you? Sure. you were... Sorry, yeah, I'm having connection, connection trouble, so it's good to be back. Um, the overall, the one thing everybody on the planet agrees is that we actually do face a climate crisis. So there is no problem with consumers globally, or in, you know, and to a certain extent, even governments all agreeing that we have a climate crisis. The challenge, of course, comes when we talk about what we might do about it. And for consumers, uh, the proportion who are willing to pay more for anything, um, uh, whatever the category you're looking at, even if it's buying you know, hair sh shampoo or something, is much, much smaller than the proportion who are concerned. So there is this sort of say-do gap Consumers are willing to be led. Uh, they, they believe business and government can make a much bigger difference than they can. They also tend to assume that in the same way that they now assume um, consumer goods companies won't exploit people, will do their best to reduce pollution. They would expect increasingly that banks are transparent, that they pay their taxes, uh, et cetera. And I, I would just say, as, I'm sorry because I've dropped out, but I think one area on, in digital, we need to be very thoughtful about is because we've removed so much friction and sometimes of course for people's safety we need to put more friction back in for example checking where your money is going before you press send again or verifying that it's going to the right person but the other thing that i'm seeing in in some of the markets that we're involved in in 90 countries around the world is is these part payment or credit new credit new types of credit offering that aren't the same or don't feel the same as traditional types of debt. And we're seeing millions of people sort of actually getting into debt when they, and they don't even realize they are because we've removed, I can see Alan nodding, we've removed so much friction, it's so easy and they don't even see it as debt, but of course it goes down on their records. So the classic long-term challenge for banking, clarity about charges in, in every financial product, where they are, how they're being applied and the digital opportunity means that we sh those we should be able to make those or insist to regulators that they are very, very clearly visible because then people can act. But assuming that people can read complex or will read really complex stuff, you know, forget it, as you know, the end. Alan, do you want to comment on the buy now, pay later statement that's coming out later this week? Yes, I mean, in, indeed, when I was talking earlier about new products emerging that get around existing laws, I was thinking about the products that you were just talking about, Ben, um, buy now, pay later products that really are credit. They're lending people money, but they're not treated like credit under the laws in most countries. And we are indeed on Wednesday exploring that in a lot more detail at an event that I'll also be speaking at. Shamina, um, in your role um, driving corporate sustainability, how do you envisage getting consumers engaged and closing the intention action gap? So there are a couple of ways. I think that the, um, the most direct way is of course by uh, choice and decision-making. So for example, we have something called the Priceless Planet Coalition, which is um, a coalition of banking partners, um, uh, Conservation International and others that are, are linking um, your purchases with tree planting. And it's not tree planting that sort of is like the one and done and anybody can do it, but we've actually been uh, working with science-based approach to make sure that 
the, um, the reforestation is sustainable over time. That's one way is the direct way to sort of say, you buy something, you do something and something else happens for the environment. The other way though, which is also very interesting, and I think longer term sustainability, uh, longer, longer term sustainable is this idea of sustainable choice and sustainable consumption. Um, Gilly talked about consumption as the root of the consumer um, activity. Well, with all of the new technology and all of the new data, what if consumption by default was the one that was better for the environment? And so, of course, there's a lot, there's a lot to do around that, but at a at a baseline level, we have a lab that we've just opened that is exploring just that. We have a sustainability net lab that we've just opened in the Nordics that is looking at decision making um, and how do we, how can we support and help decision making in such a way that the default decision is the one that helps the environment, not hurts the environment. Brilliant, thank you. And Juguna, a lot of the conversation has come to regulation as the way in which we must, at global level, at national level, make progress. Um, what sort of what progress do you see being made, both on the earlier points we covered around uh, data protection, but also perhaps uh, touch on this sustainability point? Thank you very much. And uh, let me say that we have been working on different areas, especially now that I'm in research, but I'm putting the central banks in the region together. Like for example, we are working on a project by Bill, from Bill and Mary Gates Foundation on financial services for the poor, but we are talking about financial inclusion and market development. And then this is where we have strides of uh, consumer protection, consumer literacy on one side. And the other one is actually making, making it easier for you to be in the, for the products that are uh, coming to the market. And I do believe that it is just the knowledge base, that's one, secondary, market uh, accessibility, and third, the diversity of products that is going to help us sustain the market. In fact, I saw a question coming up in terms of, is cryptocurrency part of digital finance? And I said, yes, but what is cryptocurrency? Cryptocurrency is just a trading instrument. It, it, they originated because of the frustrations in our payment system and even cross-border uh, remittances. But the problem is that we don't know the supply and demand conditions for these products. And sometimes when they have a, um, an attack, you lose all your wealth. So essentially I am saying, yes, it's part of the digital currency. Maybe it is even pushed us to think further about that, but we, did, we need regulation. We, if you don't have safeguards, then it can't work. The second thing is that at the, because of these studies that we are conducting, we are actually trying to say, can we have uniformity across countries in terms of the regulation. We have shared, our, when I was in governor of Central Bank of Kenya, we shared our regulations across Sub-Saharan Africa, including because I was also in the uh, Alliance for Financial Inclusion in Malaysia, we were coordinating financial inclusion in Latin America, Asia, and uh, in, in Africa. We were sharing all these um, regulations. So in, it, it means that some aspects of that have gone to several countries in terms of what we are doing, and we have also received from other countries in terms of what we should do. So for me, it's the institutional makeup of the central banking, who is the regulator. But the other thing is that we want to make an assumption that it's only the financial regulator, which is critical. No, we have to bring in so many regulators. In my time as the governor of the central bank, I was in, in London in a conference, and one of the ministers told me that 3 million Kenyans have been um, blacklisted from uh, digital heading just because they cannot, they are, they are, they are borrowing for the digital lending, for digital betting. So the regulator on that side of betting has failed you. So essentially you can be working and if you think you're working in a silo, then you know you don't know what is going to hit you. So again, it is a question of how do we coordinate the regulatory aspects because it's not just financial regulation. There are also other, other regulatory um, institutions that need to come in. Thank you. Brilliant. I wish we could continue this conversation for a lot longer. Um, we have had a fantastic conversation covering, you know, don't sign up with companies that don't have data protection by default. You know, a brilliant challenge from Shamina. Um, we've seen the collective challenge of closing the intention to action gap on sustainability so that we can uh, act on the climate crisis. We've talked about the need for global action, global uh, approaches to regulation and stronger regulation and enforcement. 
Um, and all I would love to do in the remaining 30 seconds each, I'd like to hear your wishes for World Consumer Rights Day. I'm going to end with our consumer advocates. So if I can start, Shamina, 30 seconds, your wish to everybody listening for World Consumer Rights Day. Uh, that you hold companies accountable and you put yourselves at the center of the equation. Brilliant. Jaguna, can I have your wish to everybody for World Consumer Rights Day? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. I do believe that uh, consumers can actually make, make the market move. I think we have relied on the market telling the consumers what to do. It is the time that we say, look, let the tail wag the dog now. So the consumers must discipline the market. Brilliant. Ben. Well, I, I think, I mean, regulation has massively improved over the last um, decades. And, it, we, we, and as, as finance in, evolves with digital, we will need to, regulators will need to keep up because as with social media, where three quarters of people globally want more regulation of social media, regulators spurred on by consumer advocates will need to keep up. Um, I'm sure, you know, I love bankers and, and people in digital finance, but ultimately they need to be kept on the straight and narrow by pressure from organizations like this. Ben, thank you. Gilly. Well, um, I think um, for this week, I hope that, you know, everyone will all in a sudden realize the fact that um, there's so many opportunities for us, um, but whether we have put the right level of resources to do what we want to do. So uh, I really hope after this week, after hearing all the priorities, after hearing all the ideas, we are committed to put more, much more resources in driving this agenda because it is so important for global consumers and we have, it is a long road ahead for us indeed. Thank you so much, Gilly. And the final word is yours, Alan. I hope that people go away from events like this feeling inspired that we can actually make um, digital finance marketplaces work more fairly for everybody. So we enjoy all the benefits of innovation without being exposed to the risks. Thank you to all my wonderful panelists. You've been absolutely inspiring. And with that, I think we can collectively declare the Fair Digital Finance Forum open for the week. Looking forward to seeing you in other sessions. Take care. Bye-bye.